God wrote every one of our stories before any of us were born. Every one of us has a call on our life. We are His work workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do. So not only were we created to be a child of God, a son or daughter of God, we were equally created to do something. Your book, Driven by Eternity, is what we're going to be talking about tonight. Why is eternity and why is this book going to change people's lives? How do, we, how, do, how do you help us tonight with this book? Matt and Lori, it makes no difference where anyone is in life, what we're doing in life. We will never understand our life or this life in general unless we see it through the eyes of eternity. Many, many, and I'm talking Christians, really don't see life through the eyes of eternity. They see it through 70 or 80 years. When you have a 70 or 80 year perspective, you will live differently than if you have an eternal perspective. I was in Brazil 11 months ago and um, I flew down there to Goiânia. It's I think the fourth or fifth largest city in Brazil. And they asked me to speak to the pastors and leaders of a church network. So they drive me to the arena and there's 12 1,500 pastors and leaders in this arena. Wow. And the passion was unreal. I mean, electrifying, okay? And so the next day I'm at lunch with like eight of the top leaders of this organization. I said, okay, how many people are in your churches? Because they had several churches. They said over 300,000 people. And I said, wow, that's huge. I said, when did you guys begin? Who did it start with? And they said, and I'm thinking they're gonna say 40, 50 years ago. And they said, well, we started 16 years ago in 1999 with one man and they said his name. And I about dropped my fork. I'm like, what? You mean to tell me you have built a church network of over 300,000 people in a first world nation in 16 years? They said, yeah. I said, how do you do that? And I thought for sure, Matt and Lori, they were gonna say to me, it's because of our home cell groups. Hmm. But without even batting an eye, without even pausing, hesitating. The leader who spoke the best English looked right at me and goes, it's because we teach our people on eternal rewards and judgment. He said, we teach them on the judgment seat of Christ. He said, now, John, I've been to many churches in America and conferences. He said, Americans don't teach it. So basically it comes down to this. When you see life through eternity, you will pursue things differently. You will live differently. Your goals will become different. You will endure things that you wouldn't necessarily endure. C.S. Lewis made this comment. He said, the people, if you study church history, the people that made the greatest impact in this world are precisely those who thought most about the next. He said, it is since Christians have become less next world minded that they have become so ineffective in this one. Why is that? Because they don't see life in perspective. Life is not about 70 or 80 years. We are talking eternity here. We wanna understand why and what the concepts are in here that are gonna help change our life. So just help us, help us understand deeper into what this book is about. John the Apostle, when he was in his 90s, he wrote Second John. And you know, when people get older, I, I'm sure you've seen this and I've seen this and they've served Jesus faithfully for years. They can say a whole lot in a few words. Mm -hmm. Well, this one verse in 2 John verse eight caught my attention and this is how it started with me. John said, look to yourselves that we don't lose what we worked for, but that we would receive a full reward. Now God is a rewarder. Mm -hmm. I mean, he introduces himself to Abraham by saying, I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. What a way to introduce yourself to somebody when you're God, okay? But the thing that really got my attention, Matt and Lori, was John didn't say live in such a way that you're gonna get a reward. He said full reward. And I started thinking for there to be a full reward means what? That means there's a partial reward scenario and there's a no reward scenario. Now, isn't it interesting that John doesn't write and say, hey, live in such a way that you're gonna get a partial reward. Why doesn't he say that? Because God wants us, I'm, I want everybody to hear me out there because God wants you to receive the full reward. You know, as a father of four sons, I love rewarding my sons. I know you two feel the same way, but as a wise father, I've learned you don't reward your sons unless they've earned it or deserve it. Mm. Because if you reward them without earning or deserving, you take away incentive and incentive is actually a good thing, not a bad thing. Mm. And so what is John talking about here? Well, he's talking about something, as I said, that many Christians, and I'm talking Christians, don't know and understand. And that is one day we're all gonna stand before Jesus Christ as our judge. You say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, whoa, whoa. Jesus is my savior. Yes, he's our savior. But one day we're gonna stand before him as judge. 
You say, John, where do you get that from? Second Corinthians chapter five. Paul said, we would rather be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We know right there, Paul's not talking to all humanity. Because when an unbeliever is absent from the body, they're in hell. That's not a mean, harsh statement. That's a statement of fact. We've got to remember Jesus said, I came to save you. I came to save you out of what you condemned yourselves into. He didn't come to condemn us. He came to save us out of what we put ourselves into. So we know Paul's only talking to Christians there. Then he says, therefore, we make it our aim or our goal, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. You know, I remember the time when Lisa and I were sitting at the dinner table and our boys were teenagers. Matt and Lori, you know what I said to them? <laughs> I looked at them one night because I, I, was, I was feeling some things and I said, guys, I, I want to talk to you about something. They all looked at me like, okay, here we go. Dad's going <laughs> to say something. And I said, you can't do one thing to make your mother and I love you any more than we love you. And I said, and you know what? You can't do one thing to make us love you any less than we love you. And you could just see him reveling in that, right? Mm -hmm. And then I waited a few seconds and I said, but... But. You are in charge of how pleased we are with you. <laughs> and, you know, I want to say to everybody out there, you can't do one thing to make God love you any more than he loves you. Right. And you can't do a thing to make him love you any less than he loves you. But we are in charge of how pleased he is with us. That's why Paul said we make it our goal not just to be pleasing, but to be well-pleasing. Why? Very next scripture. For we, we here as only Christians, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Mm -hmm. Now, when you hear the word bad in regard to Christians, you're going, wait a minute, the two don't go together. Now, every one of us is going to stand before Jesus as our judge. Now, we will not, and this is so important that we all understand this, we will not be judged for our sins mm -hmm. because our sins have been eradicated by the blood of Jesus. Thank Everybody you, say, Lord. thank God Amen. for that. Amen. Amen. Everybody clap on that one, yeah. <laughs> what we will be judged for is how we live this life as believers. Now, when people, when especially Christians, hear that word judgment, do you know what they associate that word with? Condemnation. Mm -hmm. The word judgment, most of the time that appears in the New Testament in regard to Christians, is the Greek word krema, which simply means a decision resulting from an investigation. So Jesus is going to do an investigation on our life as Christians. Mm. He's going to examine our words, our thoughts, our motives. You say, what? Our motives? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 says, Don't judge anyone before the time until the Lord comes and reveals our private motives and secret intentions. And then each man's praise will come from God. No sinner is going to get praise from God. He's talking about Christians. As a result of this investigation, Jesus is going to make decisions over our life. And the, as a result of those decisions, we'll either receive rewards or we'll suffer losses. And the Bible is very clear. The rewards we can receive to the losses we can suffer are anywhere from reigning beside Christ forever and ever and ever, all the way to having everything we did burned up. The former would be the full reward. The latter would be the no reward. And everything between is the partial reward. Now, in Hebrews chapter 6, it tells us those decisions he makes over our life are called eternal judgments, eternal decisions. So what that tells us is there's never going to be any changes to those decisions. There's never going to be alterations. There's never going to be any amendments. So what that tells us is this. What we do with the cross determines where we're going to spend eternity. We all know that, heaven or hell. However, the way we live as believers determines how we're going to spend eternity. Wow. So you're kind of talking about that. I'm, oh, we're, 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 we're on common ground here. You're talking about Jesus and, and his finished work at the cross is, it deter <coughs> is determining where we spend eternity. Yes. When you are in heaven, there is this second judgment that we're talking about that you're that you're espousing that live through you know driven be driven by eternity because of that judgment well there's two judgments there's the great white throne judgment i'm going to refer to it the way scripture does that's where people who have not embraced the lordship of jesus in their life will stand and give an account to god and no one will be able to stand before god then there's the believer's judgment seat the one I just referred to is the believer's judgment seat. And I, and I need to say this, that I remember when God asked me to write this book. I, I, I remember where I was. It was 5.30 in the morning. 
I was on the 18th hole of a golf course. It was the dog leg left. I know exactly where I was on it. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit said to me, I want you to write a, a book on the judgment seats. And I laughed. I said, okay, God, I have preached on this maybe 20 minutes my entire life. How can I write a chapter, let alone a book? And of course he said nothing. Well, what I did is I got every scripture in the Bible on eternity, rewards, losses, judgment, heaven, hell, from seven different translations. I put it in a notebook and it was about that thick. And I did nothing but meditate. And I found out God has a lot to say about eternity. To be honest with you, that's the longest book I've ever written. Isn't that interesting? I even think I could write a paragraph. I, I mean, a chapter. But that, that is so, there is so much more to talk about. And we have to think about this in the light of our creator. Look at what we have around us. Look at the creativity, the ingenuity, business, free marketplace that we have in this world. Are we thinking that when we go to heaven, it's gonna be clouds and harps? Wow, yeah. Okay, no way. This magnificent God with all this ingenuity and creativity, life is gonna be so much more full. Well, you're gonna have positions in that life. Wow. You're gonna have positions of leadership. You're gonna have CEOs. You're gonna have board members. You're going to have vision casting uh, uh, groups. You're going to have all these different positions. Then you're gonna have maybe not as important as a role in leadership positions. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine somebody walking into a room filled with people and said, all right, we are, um, let's say we could live in these physical bodies a little longer than what we live now. I'm, I'm gonna try to give our audience a glimpse right now of what we're talking about. They walk into this room filled with people and they said, all right, the way you spend the next 24 hours, one day will determine how you're gonna spend the next thousand years on this earth. Hmm. Now think about a thousand years. If you go back a thousand years, there is no United States, no TBN. There's, uh, <laughs> There's, there's no Christopher Columbus. The guy wasn't even born yet. There's no King Louis XIV of France. He's not even born yet. A thousand years is a long time. Yet the job we do, the people we work with, the position we hold, the neighborhood we live in, the type of house we live in, who our neighbors are, whether we're going to live in Siberia or Newport Beach, California, all is going to be determined by how we live the next 24 hours. How would you live that next 24 hours? Wow. Would you live it with purpose? or would you throw it to chance? Yet that's nothing compared to what we're talking about here because James says this life is a vapor. If James was alive today, he wouldn't have written it that way. He would have said this life is zero. How do I know that? Because we know something through simple mathematics that James didn't know and understand. And that is this, any, any finite number divided by infinity is equal to exactly zero. So if you live to be 80 years and you divide 80 years by eternity, you get zero. If you live to be, the oldest man I think was told, I, the oldest person on earth right now I think is 146. I might be wrong on that. But if you divide, if, if we live to be 146, God forbid, and, <laughs> right? and you divide 146 by eternity, you still get zero. So what that tells me is I'm setting myself up for how I'm going to live throughout the rest of eternity by this zero time. Wow. Well, all I know is that we don't want to get this wrong because <laughs> we only have one chance. That's yeah. right. So, um, so how, how do we begin to think about what I do tomorrow, about how to take this seriously, that my decisions, that what I do tomorrow affects my eternity? How do we, what do we do today for our tomorrow? You know, um, when, I, when I looked at all, remember I said I got that real thick notebook of scriptures? Yes. Lori, uh, I, I'm sitting there and I realize there's two major areas I can see that we're going to be examined by Jesus as Christians. Area number one is our involvement in building the kingdom of God. In regard to our gifts, our callings, okay? That's one area. The other area he's going to, he's gonna look at us as, how do we influence, how do we build people's lives? So what I, what I mean by build is how do we influence the waiter? How do we influence our children? Mm -hmm. How do we influence the people we work with? Um, I have a story in the book of a paper mill janitor who has impacted millions of lives. 
And I literally, it was amazing how God was able to show me how him affecting one man in another ended up being millions. And the man he affected, his, now I'm going to say it from memory, it's accurate in the book. All of his brothers and sisters, which was six, ended up in insane asylums. My goodness. His father was shot by another man. His grandfather was shot by another man. His mother is in an insane asylum. This man has an accounting firm with 10,000, over 10,000 clients. He has led hundreds of them to the Lord. He greatly impacted my life. Wow. And I now have touched and impacted millions. Mm -hmm. That one paper mill janitor has effectively impacted. And God, I believe, does this for everyone yeah. if we walk out what he's created us to do. So the one that really intrigues me the most is our involvement in building the, car, the kingdom of God in regard to our, our gifts and our callings. I look at every one of us, every human being, every one of us has a call on our life. We, we erroneously think Billy Graham has a call, hmm. okay? Paul and Jan Crouch had a call. We think of missionaries having a call. We think of a, Dar a Darlene Check or a Joel, you know, a Joel uh, um, Houston. Uh, Houston <laughs> having a call. We look at these people and say they have a call in their life, but I'm just here to exist. Well, right there, you're not understanding life. God wrote every one of our stories before any of us were born. This is amazing when you think about it. I mean, Jesus himself is called the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Mm -hmm. David made the comment, he said, every day of my life was recorded in a book before I was born. Every moment was written in that book before a single day began. Now, let me go back to, the, let, me, let, me, let me revert back to that by, after, by looking at what Paul says in the New Testament. Paul says, we are his work, workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do. So not only were we created to be a child of God, a son or daughter of God, we were equally created to do something. Mm -hmm. He said to do good works, which God ordained from the foundation or God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Notice he didn't say we would walk in them. He said we should. Now, God prepared what he called us to do beforehand. See, Paul made a statement. He said, run your race in such a way that you're going to win the prize. Now, if anybody's ever run cross country track, they know if you're going to run in that, that meet, you have to know the route. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't know the route, you'll start running and you will run and you will run <laughs> and you will run and the sun will set and you will run until you fall over and they carry you home. <laughs> but you won't finish. Why won't you finish? Because you didn't know your route. Mm -hmm. So the only way Paul could say, run your race in such a way that you're going to win the prize is if we know our route. Paul said, I finished my race. Jesus said, I finished the work that you've given me to do. Somebody says, yeah, but that's Jesus. He was like born knowing what to do. No, he had to seek the will of him who sent him. He constantly said that. He wasn't born with privileges that we don't have. So we have, we have been put on this earth for a purpose and that purpose is seen over the entire span of mm -hmm. eternity. That's what's so amazing about it. So when David comes along and says, you saw me before I was born, every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was recorded in that book before a single day began. We now understand what God does. He said, I am the God who sees the end from the beginning because I wrote the whole thing out, how, how I want it to go, and then we're gonna go back and start it. That's why Jesus called the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. So you're not here by an accident. You weren't born because two people got passionate in the back seat of a car. You're here because God willed for you to be right. here and God has a plan mm -hmm. for you. And that plan just doesn't happen to be, well, just exist and get by and just make your house payments. It's an eternal plan. It's, it's, got, it's got effects that are going to be seen throughout eternity because we're all here building literally the house that God's going to dwell in forever and ever. Mm -hmm. God's building himself a custom home and he called it Zion, all right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember when Lisa and I had the privilege one time, a guy got really ministered to by the beta Satan and he was the best custom home builder in Orlando, Florida. And he said, I want to build you a custom home. I remember when he laid out that paper and said, draw your dream house. Lisa and I went nuts. And then when we went to the job site, <laughs> We noticed he never came and nailed one nail. 
He didn't, he didn't lay one brick. All the subcontractors did it. God's the home builder of his home that he's going to spend eternity in. It's called Zion. He said, I've desired this place that I'm going to live in. But we're the subcontractors that are building his home. Hmm. And do you know, all the universe is going to come to this home of his called Zion. And it's a big home. It's 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. All the universe is going to come in. All rulership, all leadership throughout the whole universe is going to come in and out of this city called Zion that's going to be located in where Jerusalem is right now, over there in Israel. And people will come and they will see this magnificent house that God lives in that is made up of people. Because Peter said, we're living stones. Jesus is the chief cornerstone of this house that God's building for himself. So he, he wants to dwell within us and he's using us figuratively as saying, you're my building materials. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to just stop and think about it. Let's say that, let's say that some, some young kids are going on a, a school trip. What, what do you call it? You know, a field trip. A field trip. And they're going to go see the 700 Pennsylvania Avenue. They're going to go see the White House. And, 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 and this little boy comes home and he goes, we're going to go on a field trip. Dad, do you want to come? And this dad happened to be the plumber that worked on the White House. Can you imagine what that dad will go through when that kid is looking at his classmates going, my dad helped build that house. That house is going to be destroyed one day. Mm -hmm. But can you imagine what it's going to be like throughout eternity when people come in? Because there's going to be people that are natural bodies that aren't glorified saints. There's going to be more types of people that come and see this great city. So let's just pretend that um, I have messed my life up for all these years, how does God redeem that, John? If I've messed my life up through all these years, God can always redeem it when we turn our lives to Him. He can do much with little. And so here's the deal. It doesn't matter where you are in life right now. Today is the first day of the rest of your life if you choose to follow Jesus. And he can do so much through you, even if your life is very short compared to what you've already lived. And so it's really important that people understand that, that God wants us to be involved with him. He didn't want to be alone. He wanted a family. He wanted people he could work with. He wanted people that he could dream with, that he could plan with, that he could accomplish things with. That's what Paul means when he says we are co labors with God. God wanted that. He makes it very clear he doesn't need us, but his passionate desire is to include us in all his magnificent works that he does. And Lori, you said, what if the person is convinced there's no eternity? Here's the deal. God has placed eternity in our hearts. Job said nobody can begin to understand eternity. Mentally, we can't comprehend it. I mean, think about it. What's at the end of the universe? Right. Is there a wall? <laughs> well, what's on the other side of the wall? Wouldn't that be the end of the universe? I mean, think about a God who was never born, never created, and who will never end. Your mind just goes completely tilt. Mm -hmm. But you get it with your heart. That's why the Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. There's a lot of self-proclaimed atheists I remember I was sitting on a plane next to a woman and I was getting ready to edit a book. I was flying from Denver to Hawaii and I was going to speak in a conference and I thought, oh, I'm so far, far behind in editing this book. I'm going to use this eight hour flight and just get the whole thing done. And I sit next to this talker. <laughs> oh my gosh, she will not stop talking to me. And she just keeps going on and on and on. And, and I almost got a little rude. Well, actually I did and I feel bad about it, but I kind of opened my computer. I was like going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I was trying to send her the message of, I got a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. She didn't stop talking. So finally I thought, this isn't going to work. So I just closed it and I just turned and thought, I'm going to talk. Mm -hmm. Now, she was a beautiful 35-year-old blonde lady, right? And she's obviously extremely wealthy because she has a home in Tahiti, a home in Hawaii, a home in New York, and a home in Paris. And all she does is play. And she was on her home way to her home in Hawaii. So we're having actually a lot of fun talking and it's about 35 minutes into our conversation and I, I start telling her about Jesus. She goes, oh, John, 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 before you go any further, you have to know I'm a, I'm a devout atheist. And before I could even think, I just went, oh, come on, you are way smarter than that. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, that's actually what I was gonna say to you. 
And what happened was <laughs> I started to speak and I identified what she already knew in her heart. Mm -hmm. See, God says he's placed this knowledge in every single human being's right. heart. And only the fool has completely convinced his heart, hardened to the heart, his heart to the place where he says there's absolutely no God. Most atheists haven't gotten that place yet. Mm -hmm. They're just stupid up here, okay? Mm -hmm. and, 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 I, and I'm being respectful here. It, it, I was stupid up here, okay, at one point. Yeah. It's just when you can look at this creation and say there's no God, you're being stupid at that right. point. Okay, because this declares this creation declares his, his greatness. Glory. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> yes, it does. so yeah, I mean, you can't understand eternity with your mind, but I guarantee you, everybody right now, their heart is coming alive. They're, they're, you're going, okay, wait a minute. So, you were asking me about about our callings, and and I and I got way off track, but I want to get back on that track, Matt and, and Lori. Every one of us have have a calling. Every one of us are created to do something in this life. And Ephesians 2.10 says that he has created us in Christ that we sh that to do works that we should walk in, all right? And then Psalms, David says, every day of my life was recorded in your book. Well, if you go over to the book of Ecclesiastics 3.15, the writer writes this, that which is has already been. So that which is right now has already been. If you go to my book, Matt's book, Lori's book, the book that God has, that he wrote about our lives, you'll have us at this point in time talking about him in front of all these wonderful people in the audience, in front of all these people in the television audience, okay? It's there, it's written in the book, okay? And he says, that which is to be, that's our tomorrow, has already been. But that which is in the past, we will give an account for. In other words, did we walk in the light of what he wrote in our book or did we go our own way? So if you remember in the book of Daniel, it says, the books are going to be open at the judgment. What are the books that are going to be open? The books that he wrote about our life. And he's going to say, let's see how you lived compared to what I wrote about you living. Mm. So what that tells me is this, in regard to our callings, now I'm not talking about our personal influence on the waiter or that, I'm talking about in how we build the kingdom of God. In regard to our callings, we're not going to be judged according to what we did. We're going to be judged in the light of what we were called to do you're setting it up in a way that, that is almost like leveling the playing field. Not everyone is called to be a missionary and to travel and to do this and speak and get up in front of people and do television broadcasts. Some people are called to do very specific things, very simple localized tasks. Right. And so the, the idea that we put people or other ministries on a pedestal is just r dead wrong. You know, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter where you are. God has a plan for your life and it's not too late. In Hawaii, a couple years ago, I um, was speaking at a conference and I was told that there was a Navy SEAL instructor they wanted to have dinner with me. Now, anytime a Navy SEAL instructor wants to have dinner with me, I'm gonna have dinner with them. <laughs> I just have so much respect for the SEALs. And I remember we sat down at the dinner table. It ended up being two hours long. I just started out by saying, what's your story? And he said, well, John, I, I, was, I was raised in the church and I always loved God. And he said, in order to, I thought in order to serve God more fully, I need to go to Bible school and go into ministry. He said, so I went to two years of Bible school and he said, the third year, I was interning at a large church and I was accused of sleeping with a girl in the youth group. He said, John, I never slept with her. He said, but they believed her and I basically lost everything, was put out of the denomination. Three years of work, gone. He said, I started seeking God like I've never sought him before. And he said, I heard God say to me so clearly, I didn't call you to ministry. Mm. I called you to military. Mm. He said, so I went to the army. I went to the Marines, I went to the Air Force, and he said the last one was the Navy. And he said, I'm in the Navy recruiting office, and the man's going down through a list of things that I could, you know, enlist for. And he says the word SEALs. And he said, when I saw the word SEALs or heard it, he said, life just exploded on the inside of me. He said, that's it, that's what I'm supposed to do. And the guy said, no, no, you don't want to enlist for SEALs. He said, every guy in this in this recruiting office flunked out. He said like 1.1, I can't remember the exact percentage of people make the SEALs. He said, I don't care, that's what I wanna do. Well, what the recruiter didn't know and he didn't know is that he didn't know how to swim. Secondly, he had such narrow ear canals that they had to literally operate on him when he was a boy 
and put tubes in his ears. And if he got any water, even just drops of water in his ear, he was in excruciating pain. So he said, John, I just started praying. He said, God, you got to teach me how to swim and you got to heal my ears. And he said, I prayed every day that God would heal my ears. And eventually he said, I went down a foot, two feet, three feet, five feet, no pain. So then three times he came up to their activation week and three times he had a disaster. First time he had, he was on an obstacle course and a big splinter came off and went right through his arm. So he had to go back and do it all over again. Second time, they were coming in a wave in San Diego. Uh, the guy's paddle behind him hit him in his ear, ruptured his eardrum. He prayed and God healed that. Third time, this is magnificent. He, he's running on the beach with a boat on his head and some kid dug a hole and he blew everything out in his knee. Mm -hmm. He went to the officer who happened to be the doctor and examined him and said, the, the doctor said, I'm, I'm not passing you on the physical. He said, now John, if you don't pass the physical, you will never be a SEAL. And he said, I said to that doctor, no, doctor, you don't understand. This is what I'm, I got to do. I've got to do this. And the doctor said, hey, I'm an officer. Are you telling me what to do? And he said, no, sir, I'm so sorry. So he said that night he got invited to a Bible study. <laughs> and he said the guy that was running the Bible study just so happened to be the superior officer of that doctor. <laughs> and he was talking about how to be led by the Spirit. Mm. And he said, like, just today, guys, he said, I had this application come across and it was denied the physical. And he said, inside, I knew this person was not supposed to be denied. So I overrode the doctor's decision. Wow. And it happened to be him. Wow. Wow. Awesome. So then he started telling me about his missions. And this is where it got really good. He said, John, we were in Iraq on one mission. And he said, there was a caravan of six, six trucks he said, I was in the last one with five other SEALs and some of the Iraqi special ops soldiers we were training. And he said, we got blown up. And he said, John, the Iraqi soldiers were, it was horrific. He said, one lost a limb. He said, one's face, half his face was gone. He said, but all my five SEALs and me were fine. He said, so my commanding officer came to me and said, you better call your parents because the Red Cross will tell them there's been an accident and they won't tell, you, tell them what your condition is and they'll be worried, so just call them. He said, now, we all carried our cell phones right here in our sleeve, and he said our cell phones had to be off, and our cell phones couldn't have any pre-programmed numbers because if we were ever captured. He said, I call my mom, and it just so happens my mom and dad are in the middle of a prayer <coughs> meeting. And she said, what just happened? She said, your cell phone just called me, and we heard an explosion. And so all of us started praying for all of wow. you Navy SEALs. Oh, wow. my goodness. And he said, Mom, next time, please pray for the Iraqi special ops guys, too, because all the SEALs were fine. Amazing stories. Another one happened where they were in an ambush in Afghanistan. They should have been dead. But his cell phone called him again, and they were in a prayer meeting again. He found out this one two weeks later. He's telling me these stories, and I'm riveted. Yeah. And I, I remember going back to the hotel and calling Lisa and said, Lisa, I've been in the presence of a man of God. Wow. The presence of God was at that table in Hawaii in such a profound way. So I know some people are th sitting there thinking out there, but I'm in my 50s. Mm -hmm. It's too late. I've already let the best years of my life go. Well, let me tell you something. Smith Wigglesworth was the greatest evangelist in the 20th century. Yep. But he didn't even start his calling until he was in his 50s. He was a plumber for all those years beforehand. There was an IT man that worked for our ministry. You know, we had three IT people that worked for us. And this guy, every time I came in the office, he was showing me pictures of Africa, talking about, he just talked about Africa too much. <laughs> so I called him into my office and he was 55 years old. And I said, his name is Bill. I said, Bill, I will buy you and your wife, Patricia, a one-way ticket to Kenya. <laughs> now, she was 62. Now, this was in 2008. He said, can I go home and talk to Patricia and come back and talk to you about it? I said, sure, go home. It's, the offer stands. So the next morning, they both came into my office. They said, we're going to do it. So they sold everything. His prized possession was his Harley. He sold that. The guy gave him like way over what he asked for it because the guy heard he was going to Kenya. Yeah. But anyway, it just all lined up. We sent him over there. In the last eight years... They have set up 32 Bible schools and all they do in their Bible schools is teach pastors and associate pastors and they use Messenger International Resources. They have changed Western Kenya. It's wow. uncanny. 
in my office two months ago. Now, you got to remember, he's now 62. She's 69 or 70. So I think she's soon, soon, too, soon to turn 70. They sat there and he's laughing and he looks at me and he goes, I've had malaria 17 times. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, I, I'm laughing with him, but I'm thinking this is no laughing matter. And then he looks at me and he says, you know, what I told my family, he said, if you want to come to our funeral, you're going to have to fly to Africa because wow. we're not leaving. Wow. He said, John, I've never been so happy. I was preaching this in Australia and um, at the Hillsong Conference. And after the conference, um, my office manager was in the hotel across the street from the Ace Arena. And this lady was just irate. And it was a lady. And, and she looked at my office. She knew my office manager down there in Australia. And she said he couldn't be serious about what he was saying tonight. <laughs> and my office manager said, well, of course he was. He believes in it. And she's, he's, he's like, what's wrong with, why are you so upset? And she said, because I, um, when I was a young girl, I had dreams. When I went to sleep at night, I had dreams of me ministering to Filipino people. Hmm. She said, I have been the senior pastor of this church in Australia for 35 years. And my office manager very wisely just said, well, mm. well, one year later, we heard she gave it to her executive pastor and she moved to the Philippines and she, according to her words, she's having the time of her life. Wow. wow. We're never ever going to be fully fulfilled until we're doing. And let me, let me tell you how this happened with me. There's a reason I'm so passionate about this. My dad was an engineer for DuPont for 40 years. And I remember my dad just saying one time, John, you should be an engineer because I was good at math, good at science. He said, you should be an engineer. So I went to Purdue University and I co-opt. And co-op means you go to school a semester, you work a semester. And the company I worked for was IBM. And I was down at Research Triangle Park down near Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina at, the, at, the, at my junior year. And all the engineers, there was about 14 of them in the department, were in a room and we were celebrating this guy's 38th year with the company. And so we're in there and they're all drinking their coffees. I don't drink coffee. So the guy goes, the guy we were celebrating goes, well, he said, I've hated every day wow. I've walked into this place wow. for 38 years. Wow. <laughs> and everybody laughed <laughs> as if to say, yeah, we're with you, right? <laughs> And I'm, I'm the only one not laughing. And I finally just go, why have you done this? Right. Okay, I'm a junior in college, right? <laughs> and he looks at me, he goes, it's a job. Wow. The money. And, and, and I made up my mind right there, I'm going to obey God. So this is what I did. That was my junior year. My senior year, I, I, I tell my Catholic mother, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not coming home for Thanksgiving. And now that one was really hard to explain, but I just said, mom, I just need to pray. She was like, pray, you can pray here at the house. I was like, no, no, no. So I, all my fraternity brothers went home and the whole fraternity house was all mine for four days from Thanksgiving day till Sunday. And I fasted and I said, God, you put me on this earth for a reason. And I'm not gonna be one of those guys that says I've hated every day for 38 years. Wow. Wow. And I remember as a result of that four day fast, God gave me a glimpse of what I'm gonna be doing. And I still have it written down. 1981, one of the, th the one, this is one of the things God said. He said, you'll be a nourishing tree off of which many nations will grow and mature. And he said, I'm raising up an army to stand with you in the work I've called you to do. Well, yeah. at the end of this year, we will have given Messenger International, we will have given 10 million resources to pastors and leaders in 84 nations. Wow. Um, our, 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 you know, our curriculums and our books. Right. And I realized, I mean, I, I was just told I'm, I'm, I'm the most published author in Vietnam, secular or Christian. I'm the most published author in Mongolia, I was just told, and I, on and on and on. God literally gave me a glimpse as a result of seeking Him. My plan to serve God was I was going to go to Harvard, I was going to get my MBA, I was going to marry a pretty girl. <laughs> I was going to take, did. and I did. I yes, got that did. one accomplished. God let me have that one. <laughs> I was going to take three vacations a year, and I was going to tithe at my church. That wow. was the way I was going to serve God. Yeah. Wow. But when I sought him, because I know people are sitting there thinking right now, how do we know what we're really created exactly. to do? Yeah. Yes. And so I'm dominating right now. I'm do, the only I one talking. It. So that's what we're <laughs> Matt, what it's we're not I'm for. not used to being around you and you being so quiet. Why are you not talking <laughs> right now? <laughs> okay. But you know what? Because that is so important. <laughs> Hang on one second. That's so important, John, because I know there are people sitting there going, I don't feel called. Everybody's I don't called. Know. Everybody is called. Yeah. Yes, you Everybody, are called. Everybody, you're called. You are called. 
and so how do we, how, you know, okay, y growing up, it was, you know, God's will for you. What is God's will for you? And I remember growing up, um, that was such a big deal in my mind going, well, I don't think I know what God's will is for me. You know, it would kind of haunt me as a little girl thinking, I've got to find out what God wills for me. What is God, you know, his kingdom. I got to get in his kingdom and, and do his will for me. What is that? And I know people, no matter how old you are, I know there are people that are crying out. Is it something that we um, feel like we need to do? You know, we talk a lot about someone feeling like, you know, I'd like to have a food ministry. Well, go get a can of beans out of your cabinet and give it to someone who needs it. You know, so ways to start something, but how do we help those people that just are frozen, they're paralyzed, not knowing exactly? First it, of all, God wants us to know what we're called to do more than we want to know what we're called to do. So if you're listening right now or watching right now, know this. God is more passionate because one day God spoke to me. He said, who, who created this ministry that I've called you to? Who created it, me or you? I said, you did. He said, don't you think I'm more concerned about my ministry than wow. you are? Good. So that helped me a lot. Good. So God's more passionate about you fulfilling what he's created you to do than even you are. So know that. Number two, when we delight ourselves in the Lord, the Bible says he gives us the desires of our heart. What does that mean? He places his <coughs> desires in us. Mm -hmm. So I've got a desire to feed people. Yeah. Listen to that. Right. Okay. But here, let's go further. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, God rewards those who diligently seek him in faith. It does not say he rewards those who casually seek him in wonder and doubt. Mm -hmm. I will be very honest with you. It wasn't until I really started seeking God. Same way with that Navy SEAL that I just explained, that God opened it up and showed it to me. Mm -hmm. And here's another thing that I have to say. He didn't show me everything. Right. He gave me a little glimpse. Yeah. I mean, Joseph gets a dream. You're going to be a leader and your brother's going to serve you. Well, he didn't get the part about the pit. He <laughs> right. didn't get the 10 years yeah. of slavery. Yeah. He didn't get the part about the, the dungeon. Yeah. He just got the glimpse. Right. So, you know, often, you know, God gives us a glimpse and we're here and here's the glimpse. And we think, oh, easy. Boom. Yeah. No. You go through this desert, this wilderness, yeah. this crucible, <laughs> this furnace, mm -hmm. this desert, this crucible, and then you end up here. Why? Because you need this desert, this crucible, this furnace, this to create the character to handle this. Come on now. Beautiful. Okay. So, so God, will, God, God, God will give you a glimpse, but the, here's the thing you have to understand. God directs our steps. Our steps are ordered of him, but you can't. Look at it like a car. You can't steer a car. God can't steer our lives unless we're moving. Right. If we're just sitting and doing nothing, like I've got a desire to feed people and I've got food in my pantry and I've got people that I see that are in need. Hello. Yeah. Go for it. Okay. You know, when I was, I knew I was called a ministry. I preached in detention homes. I preached in prisons. I preached to anybody that moved. Right. I mean, I'd find guys on the street and I'd bring them to my, my apartment and I'd tell them about Jesus and give them food and then, you know, pray for them to be healed and they'd get healed. They were the easiest people to get healed, the unbelievers. And, right. you know, just, 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 I just, I just started preaching. This, this idea that we're driven by eternity and that we are going to be judged on whether we plowed corn or preached Christ, depending on our calling, uh, starts with one very simple decision, and his name is Jesus. Yes. Okay, so after 44 years of the praise program happening in this studio, we're still talking about <laughs> the one name above all names, Amen. the name of Jesus. So how does, somebody, <laughs> how does somebody get on board with Jesus if this is something that they don't really know about. John, lead people to Jesus. You know, ABC just released a poll again. Still over 80% of Americans say they're Christian. Wow. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna challenge you right now. And I, I might say some things that might cause you to be a little uncomfortable, but you can, you can go to church. You can watch Christian television. You can know that Jesus is the Son of God, know that he even died on the cross and still not have a covenant relationship with him. You say, John, how could you say that? Well, let me give you an example. You can have a girl dating a guy. She knows he's a good football player, excellent quarterback. She knows he's got a scar on his forehead from a bicycle accident he was in when he was seven years old. 
She knows he's an excellent math student. She's been to his house. She's met his siblings. That doesn't give her a covenant relationship with him. It's not until one day he gets down on his knee, he opens up a little ring box and he said, will you marry me? At that point, she's got a decision to make. She can ignore his proposal and continue life as is, knowing about him, even going to his house with, and being with his siblings, but not having a covenant relationship with him. Or she can say yes. If she says yes, that means a couple months later, she's gonna put on a white dress, she's gonna walk down an aisle of a church, and what she's communicating is she's saying goodbye to every man on the face of the earth, except for that one guy. She's giving her entire heart, her entire life to him. When our Creator, Jesus Christ, who's God manifested in the flesh, hung on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago, it was him getting down on one knee and mm. saying, would you be my bride? Beautiful. The bride of Christ. Mm. Now at this point, we have a decision to make. We can ignore his proposal and continue life as is, knowing about him, knowing he's the son of God, knowing he died on the cross, going to a church and meeting his genuine siblings. Or we can say yes. If we say yes, we're gonna do what that bride does. We're gonna give him our entire heart, our entire life. You know, the first week after we were married, Lisa made mistakes. That didn't end our relationship. <laughs> 34 years later, she's made mistakes. And so have I, a lot more than her. It hasn't ended our relationship. But one thing that's never changed, she gave me her heart on October 2nd, 1982, and she's never taken it from me. What I'm talking to you about tonight, it's not about living right, knowing about a, a name Jesus, praying a formula prayer. I'm talking to you about giving your entire heart, your entire life to one who gave his life for you. He's coming back for a bride that has laid her life down for him the way he laid his life down for her. That's a covenant relationship. So if you say, John, truth be told, I've never really given my entire life to Jesus Christ. I want you to do that with me right now. The Bible says if you believe and you want to do this, just confess him with your mouth. Just like that bride, she stands up and she makes a vow to that groom. She says, I'm going to give you my life. And she means it. If you really mean that right now and you want to give him your entire heart, entire life, then I want you to pray this with me right now. Say this, God in heaven, God in heaven. Amen. thank you so much for sending Jesus. Thank you so much. Forgive me for living life my way, apart from you, my creator. But this day, December the 1st, 2016, I give my spirit, soul, and body everything I am, everything I have to you, Jesus. Jesus, you are now my Lord, but you're also my lover. You're my elder brother and my king. Thank you for changing me. I'm now born again. I am now a member of the household of God. I'm asking you now, fill me with your spirit so that I can experience your presence on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. So in the name of Jesus now, I pray for you. Wow. And I'm asking that the presence of God would manifest in every single living room, no matter where you're sitting, if you're at the office, if you're in your bedroom, if you're in a hospital room, may the presence of Jesus himself, the presence of his spirit manifest in you in Jesus' name, yeah. amen. Wow, beautiful. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.